good evening uh, welcome to today's network seminar talk so today's speaker will be professor rajesh sundreshan uh, professor rajesh sundreshan is a uh, faculty in the department of pc and is also associated with uh, the rbc cps he is also the convener of uh, the center for network intelligence so professor rajesh okay. okay so today i'm going to speak about the four levels of the fixed point analysis so uh, nothing that i will speak about today is going to be rigorous uh, it was all intuitive ideas but uh, most of it and uh, if not all of it can actually be made rigorous but i'll uh, stick to the level of ideas mostly okay so uh, what is the fixed point analysis so we have a system of n identical interacting nodes and they are interacting via the mean field i will clarify this as i go along the idea of the uh, fixed point is essentially to uh, impose a sort of self consistency requirement so a particle here is the uh, here are the n particles then one of them is pulled out pull out one of them and you study its response to what is called the mean field and then come up with a consistency self consistency equation that will help you understand <laughs> so uh, abstractly uh, let us say that uh, we have an individual and we have a notion of a behavior of this individual i'll call the behavior b and the uh, idea behind this is to essentially uh, impose this uh, behavior on each of the n particles with independence okay so each of them uh, is imparted this particular behavior now uh, when you have n of these particles which are uh, behaving according to b and they are also independent then that leads to a certain mean field so what's the average behavior of the entire uh, system of particles that's what i call the mean field and then you pull this one particle out and you see how this particle will respond to this mean field so here that's the mean field and so one writes down a bunch of equations that basically says that the behavior to the mean field is something now that response is essentially a function of our initial assumption b now self consistency requirement is the requirement that this t of b be b itself the one that we started with so this is going to be the central theme and what we are going to see is how to analyze the system in one specific context and there are four levels of these fixed points and i want to highlight uh, the four and also in, uh, indicate the relationship between them okay so uh, with that abstract introduction i'm now going to describe to you uh, a mean field interaction in the context of wireless lan uh, there are also similar things in the context of spin flip systems there are similar things in the context of uh, infection spread uh, systems as well but we will uh, discuss uh, in the context of wireless lan and i'll also stick to the simplest possible uh, system the oldest possible oldest uh, wireless lan system and uh, i'll describe uh, the interactions with respect to that that's the distributed coordination function uh, so it's a countdown mechanism and i'm going to look at a markovian caricature of this countdown mechanism okay. so suppose there are n nodes in the system they are all accessing common medium so those are like the n particles uh, i'm also going to assume that there are queues but the queues are infinitely backlogged at each of these nodes so each of the nodes always has a packet to send and attempts are being made to send the packet and it's always uh, with respect to the head of the line packet so there's one packet at the head of the line and the attempt is made to send that packet across to the network so every every node is accessing some access point okay so each node uh, has a back off state and the back off state i'll give uh, these names for those back off states 0 1 up to m minus 1 there are a total of m back off states so the back off state uh, in 802.11 uh, in this particular markovian uh, version of 802.11 back off is essentially something which determines the attempt probability okay for a particular uh, node in that slot so if it is in a particular state 0 it will attempt with a certain probability if it is in state 1 it will attempt in the next slot with a certain probability okay so this is a means by which you can decentralize the access so these are the states Uh, possible states for a particular node and uh, you can be in state 0 and then maybe jump back to state 0 so why, when does that happen so for example the head of the line packet is uh, uh, 
attempted for a transmission. If you succeed or if that node succeeds, it comes back to zero. This packet is out of the system. The next packet comes into the head of the line, uh, becomes the head of the line packet, and then that needs to be uh, transmitted. So we say that we are in state zero. But it's also possible that this attempted transmission failed, in which case this node moves to state one. If it fails once again, it moves to state 2 and so on. Let's say we are at state i. If it succeeds in its attempt, that packet is out of the system. The next packet comes, and so the node moves back to state 0. So in some sense, the state indicates the number of attempts made for transmission as far as the head of the line packet is concerned. Okay. At m minus 1, something interesting can happen. So it's possible that you attempt once, if it fails, you just discard the packet and come back here. But sometimes you might re-attempt. Okay? You might stay in this M minus one until you succeed. So uh, there are many variations possible. So we'll stick to this particular variation where you keep attempting <coughs> until you succeed. Okay, so these are the transitions that happen. Uh, the node can move through these states. Now uh, here is an example design, um, and the example design involves exponential backoff. So assume that there are only three states, 0, 1, and 2. So m is equal to 3. And then let us also say that the attempt probability for a node in state i is uh, something that depends on the total number of nodes in the system. So uh, this is not the case usually in the 802.11 system. But I'm going to think of a scaling framework where the number of nodes in the system goes to infinity. And so uh, to make things uh, uh, somewhat uh, analyzable, uh, and also interesting, we need to scale the attempt probabilities down by the number of nodes. So the attempt probability for a node in state i is ci by n. So the ci by n, uh, the, or the ci's themselves, they are a measure of how aggressive this particular node is in attempting to transmit when it is in state i. Now the scaling by 1 by n ensures that if you look at one particular node, it's attempting at a rate c0 by n if it is in state one, state 0, c1 by n if it is in state 2. On the order, it is, uh, uh, on the whole, it's of the order of 1 by n. And if there are, so single nodes attempt probability is 1 by n. And if there are n particles or n nodes in the system, the overall attempt rate is going to be order of 1, n times order of 1 by n. So that's of the order of 1. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why you would like to scale this uh, by n. So that uh, on the attempt probabilities of the order of one. The conventional wisdom uh, is to have exponential back off. Uh, that means ci is ci minus one by two. So that means this is the most aggressive state, state zero. If you happen to fail uh, in your attempt, then what you do is you become more polite. So you attempt with a lesser probability, with roughly with one half of the probability that uh, you used when you were in state zero, and so on. Okay, so ci is ci minus one divided by 2. So that doubles the average waiting time after every failure. So this is the way uh, it's typically designed. Okay, so now I would like to analyze this system. And uh, I'm now going to introduce this level 1 uh, fixed point analysis. Okay, This level 1 fixed point analysis involves uh, macros what I call macroscopic variables. And let's see what they are. So the macroscopic variables or the observables are collisions and attempts. Okay, so if you look at the system, uh, if you uh, watch it for some time, you will see that nodes collide. Uh, they make uh, attempts simultaneously, and then they will collide. When they collide, there is a back off. Or uh, uh, you will actually see uh, successful transmissions and, uh, and attempts. So collisions and attempts are things that you can see. Of course, uh, successful uh, attempts also are things you can see. OK, so an analyst can observe the following. So your collision probability uh, will depend, if you think about it a little, you will realize that it depends on the states of the other system, uh, other nodes in the system, but only through the empirical distribution. In other words, it doesn't matter whether particle A is in node, uh, is, uh, part, node A is in state uh, 1 and node B is in state 2 or vice versa. It just matters as far as my attempt probability of my success is concerned that there's one node in the state and one node and another node in the other state. Okay. And so only the empirical distribution of the particles across states matters in determining uh, the collision probability and so on. 
Okay, so of course, you have to pull uh, your own state out of the picture. So let's say that xi is the current empirical measure of nodes across states, and I'm now going to come up with a calculation of this collision probability. Okay, so now if xi is the uh, empirical measure of nodes across states, then there are n xi naught nodes in state 0, n xi 1 nodes in state 1, because this is actually an empirical measure. How many are there whose state is 0? That's n xi naught and so on. All right, if u are in state 0, uh, then other nodes distribution, so I have to subtract uh, um, your state, so that's n xi naught minus 1, and all the other, uh, the distributions of the other nodes are n xi 1, etc. Okay, only this matters. And so the probability that no one else transmits in this particular slot is, well, the atom probability for each of these nodes is if a node is in state i, it is ci divided by n. So none of them must transmit. Okay, only then this particular slot is free for you to succeed if you happen to transmit. So what's the chance that none of them transmits? Well, there are n xi naught minus 1 nodes which are in state 0 other than you. None of them must transmit. So the probability that none uh, that each one of them transmits is C naught by n, that it doesn't transmit is 1 minus that. Raise this to the power n xi naught minus 1. And do the same for every one of the other states. There are n xi i of them in state i. Okay, so this is the probability that the slot is actually free for you to transmit. Now, uh, you can uh, come up with a more symmetric version of this. The only thing that is asymmetric here is that um, you are in state 0 and that uh, n xi naught, that state xi naught has not been included here. Let me actually include it and then put that as a minus 1. You will actually see that uh, as n becomes large, this is negligible. Okay, so the effect of uh, you being in a particular state is inconsequential as far as this probability of collision is concerned. And I can pass to the limit, let n go to infinity, and what happens? So this is a simple calculus question. So what, what is 1 minus ci by n raised to the power n xi i? As n goes to infinity, it's going to be e to the minus ci raised to the power xi i. And so when you sum it, here is a product. When you sum it up, I get this e to the minus, the inner product between the aggressiveness vector and the empirical measures like. All right, so the probability that there is uh, no one else transmitting in this slot is e to the minus the inner product of c and xi. So in some sense, the c xi is actually a sort of activity coefficient because c is your atom probability, etc. Xi is what fraction of nodes are in which state and so on. And so c inner product with xi should measure activity and so let's see what that is. That activity is actually the attempt probability in the system. Okay. So uh, if you look at uh, C xi, that, uh, the inner product, I can write it as Ci xi i, which I can write in this form, n xi i multiplied by Ci by n. So this is the number of nodes in state i, and this is the attempt probability for a particular node in state i. And so when I look at this, that's actually the net rate of attempts in the system. So I actually call this as attempt. Okay, so it's a measure of activity in the system. And so the probability that there is no, no one else transmitting, and therefore if a node transmits in the slot, it will not encounter a collision, is e to the minus uh, the inner product, e to the minus attempt. Okay, now I'll uh, uh, indicate how to get the fixed point. So let's look at the conditional collision probability. Conditional because it's conditional on you transmitting in this particular slot. So. Suppose you ha happen to, I can, um, the condition is that you happen to make an attempt. What's the chance that you succeed? Or rather, what's the chance that you don't succeed? There is a collision. Well, it's uh, here is the probability that nobody else is transmitting. So 1 minus that. And I call that as the collision probability. So gamma is 1 minus e to the minus attempt. Okay. That's why co collision is 1 minus e to the minus attempt. <coughs> OK, so now here is another heuristic. Um, assume that the node node interactions decouple. Okay. So it's a sort of vague statement, but it's like the evolutions are all uh, they are all evolving independently. Okay. Uh, we will make this a little more uh, rigorous. At least what I mean by this in the end. Okay. Now, what I would like to say is that once I get to this collision probability, well, I have a relationship between attempt and collision probability. 
but I can actually now find a relationship between collision probability and attempt. And if I do that, I actually have an equation of the <coughs> form where uh, attempt is equal to some function of attempt. Okay, so that's the fixed point that I would like to get. Or alternatively, collision is equal to some fun function of collision. Okay, so let's see how to do that. Okay, so let's focus on a node, and I also uh, want to alert you to this assumption that the node interactions decouple. The node interactions decouple to the extent that a certain field has been created, and the field involves a collision probability of gamma. And then now I'm looking at one particular node and how this particular node's evolution uh, can be analyzed. Well, let's focus on this some tag node. And then let's look at renewal instance of this tag node, where the renewal instance are return times returns to zero. So if I whenever I return to zero, I essentially uh, say that a renewal instant, instant has occurred. And I want to find out how many attempts on the average this particular node makes. Well, the system is symmetric, so I can actually look at the overall attempts of all the nodes and then divide it by n. So that's the number of attempts on the average that this particular node makes, so that's attempt divided by n. But I can also look at this attempt divided by n on the average uh, as something that uh, can be written in terms of the average number of attempts per unit time uh, based on this returns to this uh, uh, zero state. Okay, so based on these renewals. So from the renewal uh, reward theorem, this attempt uh, number of attempts for this particular node, uh, that's the overall average, but that can be written in terms of average number of uh, rewards per uh, uh, divided by the uh, average renewal time from the renewal reward theorem, assuming things are uh, independent at the moment you come back to this uh, uh, renewal state. Okay, so now it's just a matter of trying to figure out what the expected number of attempts is in one cycle and what's the average cycle length. So what's the expected number of attempts in one cycle? Well, surely uh, you have to attempt at least once. So that's the one here. But then you attempt once more, at least, if you fail once. Okay, so with probability gamma, you have one more attempt. But with probability gamma squared, you have one more attempt and so on. So that's one plus gamma plus gamma squared and so on. So that's the expected number of attempts. And I've said dot, dot, dot here, but uh, you have to essentially handle the uh, end point in some way. And that's a good question for a graduate student to go and resolve. So here we'll stick to ideas. Okay, so just one question. Uh, what do you mean by reward here? Reward is number of attempts. Every time you make an attempt, you get a reward of one. The use of the word reward is because the uh, name of this theorem is called renewal reward theorem. Shouldn't that numerator be one plus like shouldn't it be 2 gamma square, 3 gamma cube? Mm -hmm. Because that 2 is already accounted for here. With probability gamma, you have one, one more, more attempt. attempt. With probability gamma square, you have one more attempt. And so okay, so with that, uh, we can essentially understand the numerator. Except that there is something at the end, which is just a matter of detail that uh, we can skip at this time. So if we attempt it, Yeah, that's the assumption, yeah. so. Assume that the node interactions decouple, and then it's just this node interacting and uh, experiencing a collision probability of gamma. And so under this assumption, the independence uh, follows. What about the expected renewal time? Well, uh, you're doing this uh, with uh, probability, uh, when you're in state zero, you're uh, attempting with probability C naught by N. So how long is it before you actually make one attempt? So uh, that's the expectation of a Bernoulli random variable. That's one divided by the uh, expectation of a geometric random variable with parameter C0 by N. And the expectation is one divided by the parameter. So that's N divided by C0. But with probability gamma, you experienced a collision when you made this attempt. And so you have to wait for another N divided by C1 because you moved to state one, and there the expected time is N divided by C1, and so on. And so you can see that that is the factor N that can be pulled out and it can be written as some function g of gamma divided by n, where g of gamma is one plus gamma plus gamma square divided by one by c naught plus gamma by c one and so on, gamma square by c two and so on, okay. So now you can see that here I have established attempt is some function of the collision probability, a certain function. So we can solve for the fixed point in this equation. So the gamma, the collision probability 
is equal to 1 minus e to the minus what is attempt? Attempt is just g of gamma. So here I've written the fixed point in terms of the collision probability. You could equally well write it in terms of the attempt probability. Okay, and so once you do this, once you do this, I have an equation, and without ever going into the detailed analysis of the system, I can solve for this equation and say that in this system, when I have a large number of nodes, the expected, uh, the uh, probability of a collision is gamma, and uh, the attempt uh, probability is going to be, uh, well, where is the attempt? So I'll have to essentially go and uh, invert this equation, and I'll get the attempt. So this g gamma by n was the average attempt rate by a node, right? One node, yes. One node, and then you multiply by n to get the... Yeah, so one. this is the overall attempt rate. Correct. Attempt divided by n is g gamma divided by n. So the overall attempt for the entire system is g gamma. Okay, so the... So one minus, so the gamma was somehow was for a node, right? But now you're saying that is also for the system. Gamma is for a node, but gamma is the collision probability uh, seen by any node and in any state. The, in any state came from, uh, I don't want to go all the way yeah, back. Yeah. Yeah. It, it came from the previous slide. Yeah. <coughs> but it's for any node. So I'm not able to understand uh, if we solve the fixed point of this equation, what does it mean? Like, Let's say there is a gamma which solves this. So what does it mean? So it is our guess at this moment mm -hmm. that the system behaves in this way where uh, nodes are attempting and the uh, overall collision probability mm -hmm. for a particular node, the, the probability that it will experience or the rate of collisions that a node experiences mm -hmm. is gamma. Yes. That's the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, you can invert this and come up with an exp a, a, a number for attempt. The overall activity in this particular network is that attempt value. That's the interpretation. It involves a lot of assumptions, etc. But the fixed point analysis is a heuristic, and this is the heuristic. Okay, yeah, I can run the system for a long period of time. This will be the first. We'll come to that. <coughs> I'll come back to explain uh, how to interpret this. At this point, it's not clear that this has a solution. Um, at this point, it's not clear that it has a solution. The hope, uh, but it's just a matter of. Uh, Analyzing this equation and uh, the choice of the C0, C1, etc. So, uh, I'm sorry, one more question. So, their attempt it was well defined because it came through the limit and you got as inner product of C and Psi. Here, somehow you say the number of tries I made will end up being in the exponent, and I didn't quite get that. So, it's a heuristic, yes. Okay, said. it's a heuristic. Yeah. Attempt is the expected number. Attempt is the expected number of. Uh, so you take the long term average. So the moment I put this, use the renewal reward theorem, I have a long t, and I'm looking at uh, a particular node and how many atoms it makes, and in fact all the nodes as well, and I take the average across all so, of that. So, so that's the long term average of the number of uh, long term average of the attempts. So it's an attempt. Here you should interpret it as an attempt rate. So there you had got attempt by writing the property that nobody that's has right. to transmit. Yes. But here um, I, I'm not. Here I understand that long term average number of tons of number, but to put that in exponent is somehow something so which you are invoking. That means that there is some underlying ergodicity assumption that is being assumed in order to be able to write this. But this gamma is a conditional probability. Yes. But, uh, so this is when you make the attempt, what's the chance that you fail? Only then you have one more attempt to make. Right? So it's a conditional <coughs> Okay, so you write this because there is an assumption of ergodicity that's uh, underlying this uh, expression. Okay, so that's the level one fixed point. Why would you expect that uh, the overall system is in that fixed point? We'll come to that. Yeah. But is there an interpretation of this as like the property that no, so this heat form is G gamma somehow that nobody transmits, right? Oh no, or somebody transmits. Because one month. Yeah, I, I'll give another. So I think when you see level two, you'll get a better picture. Level three, you'll get an even better picture. Level four, perhaps everything will be clear. Okay. So now, before I go to level two, um, I want to generalize this beyond the wireless LAN example. Okay. And so, uh, 
we already saw that there is coupled dynamics here because your uh, movement or your evolution depends on uh, whether somebody else is transmitting or not. So definitely the evolution of a particular particle or node states depends on the other node states and their attempts and so on. So dynamics is coupled. And so what I want to do is I want to essentially turn this discrete time dynamics, slot by slot dynamics into a sort of continuous time dynamics. Uh, so uh, just because uh, I like to think uh, things in terms of continuous time. So for this I will do, and it's a good approximation by the way, uh, what for this I will do an embedding of the slot boundaries on the real line, zero to infinity. And I'll assume that the slot durations are of size one by n. Okay, so that's it's an evenly spaced uh, grid of uh, time points. <clears throat> and then things are, have, so a particular transition happens in a particular slot. Now, what's the transition rate for a particular node? So now let's look at that. Well, there is a certain probability of a change in a slot. The change happens when you make an attempt. And if you succeed, you go to zero. If you fail, you go to the next uh, higher state. So the probability of a change in a particular slot is ci divided by n multiplied by the probability that there is either a collision or no collision. That's of the order 1 over n. But then the slot duration is also of the order 1 over n. So overall, it's of the order 1. So that means that the transition rate for a particular node in the embedded uh, dynamics, the dynamics that I'm going to come up with, is order of 1. Transition rates are, are, are the order of 1. So the transition rate for success or failure depends on the states of the other nodes. I uh, al already mentioned this. But it depends on the other nodes or only through the empirical measure. Okay. And that empirical measure, I'll write it as mu n of t. Mu n of t is the uh, description of what fraction of nodes are in which state at time t. And the n stands for there are n particles, and n nodes in the system. Okay, so. okay, at time t, a node transits from state some i to state j, and these transition rates are as follows in our example. So let's take the wireless LAN example. You can move only from either i to i plus 1 nor i to 0. Those are the only two possibilities. You, of course, remain in that state when you don't make an attempt at all. So, but we are only looking at transitions and transition rates. So what's the i to i plus 1 transition rate? That I will write as lambda i i plus 1. So you're going from i to i plus 1. And it depends on the states of the other particles. So the empirical measure is uh, writing it as mu n of t. Okay. I'll give you an explicit expression in the next slide. Similarly, i to 0 is lambda i 0. And in general, uh, here the uh, transitions were only either one step ahead or all the way down to 0. But in general, you can have transitions to any other uh, j. And uh, that might be given up front. And let's uh, take it to be in general, lambda ij of the empirical measure. So this is the mean field interaction. It describes the transition rates of a particular node, which is in state i. Uh, what is the rate at which it transitions to state j uh, when the empirical measure is mu n of t? Yeah. All right, so let's see in our specific wireless LAN example what the lambda ijs are. And I want to say that they depend on the empirical measure. Let's see how. So here's the example. Let's say that mu n of t, the current empirical measure, is xi. And uh, I want to see what's the transition that a node which is in state 0 jumps to state 1. Okay, How can this happen? Well, it's a node which must make an attempt. Otherwise, it will not move to another state. And in its attempt, it must succeed or fail. So if it's going to 1, it must fail. So somebody else must essentially attempt. So the chance that it makes an attempt is C0 divided by n. And the probability that there is another node attempting is 1 minus e to the minus attempt. So the activity was attempt. And e minus that was the probability that there is no collision. This is the probability that there is a collision. I'm thinking of rates here. And so I must divide it by the slot uh, size to find out what the transition rate is. So probability in the small uh, 1 by n interval divided by the interval size. And so that's C0 multiplied by 1 minus e to the minus the activity coefficient. Okay. And so one can write down the matrix of rates now, because similarly, you can write for the other ones as well. And so this is the matrix of rates. So here is the uh, one that we just wrote. So you're moving from state 0 to state 1. You attempt with this rate divided by n, 
but then the rate will knock off the one by n because the slot size is one by n. And then this is the probability that there is no collision. Of course, you don't jump from state zero to state two, so there's a zero there. Uh, as far as uh, state one is concerned, you can succeed. When do you succeed? Uh, C1 divided by n multiplied by the probability that nobody else is transmitting, so e to the minus the activity coefficient. And then the slot size is one by n, so that's C1 e to the minus the activity coefficient. And similarly here. Okay, so this is uh, the transition from one to state two. And this one indicates that you will wait until you succeed on the particular uh, packet before you come to state zero. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, transition rates. And now we are going to generalize. So this is for the uh, particular example. But let's just say that there is a lambda ij of the empirical measure. So you can see how the empirical measure enters into the picture here in the transition rates. Okay, so for today's exposition, I'll assume this continuous time caricature with these instantaneous transition rates. The instantaneous transition rates are lambda ij of whatever is the current empirical measure. So let me go back. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, assume that there is some transition uh, graph. Uh, whenever an allowed transition is uh, possible, there is an edge between i and j. And then that transition rate is given by a function of the empirical measure. Now, this is actually different from the particular example, in, in the case of the particular example when you go to this continuous time caricature, because in the uh, slotted version, two nodes will simultaneously make a change. That's the only way you can essentially, two nodes must attempt for something to happen. Of course, when you're successful, only one node will go back to zero. But such a thing never happens in this uh, continuous time caricature. Okay. Nevertheless, it's a good approximation. Okay, so now with this, I want to describe the level two distribution, uh, which is uh, a fixed point over distribution over states. Okay. So quickly, the level one, one, level one was related to collision probabilities and attempts, uh, which is a macroscopic uh, version. Uh, these are fixed points of macroscopic variables. Now I'm going to speak about level two, which is distributions, distribution over states. Okay, so how does one uh, uh, come up with a fixed point in this case? So suppose that an individual's probability distribution of individual nodes probability distribution of being in various states is given by xi. Okay. Now assume that, once again, the same independence assumption comes into the picture. Assume that the node distribution is IID with this distribution. Now this leads to, a, to an equilibrium response probability distribution. So let me uh, explain that. Now, if, uh, let us say, uh, I mentioned that if each of the nodes are in this particular state, then there is a field. And the field is also given by, field is the average across all of those things, that's given by the xi. Okay, and I'm now going to pull one of the nodes out. So if the field is given by xi, my transition rates, or this particular node which has been pulled out, the rates that it will experience, is going to be given by lambda ij of xi, because xi is the current field or the empirical measure. And now let's see uh, what the uh, uh, constraints are on this particular node. And the constraint that I will impose is if I look at the dynamics of this particular node's evolution across time, every time I enter into a particular state, I also exit, right? Oh, except for perhaps the last exit. That essentially means that entry rates and exit rate, how, how uh, what fraction of the time did I spend in this particular node? No, I shouldn't look at that. I should look at entries and exits. So the number of transitions into state, into a particular state, is the same as the number of exits from that particular state, except for the last uh, time. And of course, if I let time go to infinity, I can say that the entry number of entries per unit time is the same as the number of exits per unit time. And I'll do this for a particular state k. That will give me the uh, behavior associated with this particular node as far as this uh, field is concerned. Okay. So this is the, uh, the this T map is in that in our uh, fixed point uh, abstraction uh, that tells how a particular node will behave when the field is okay. So let's see what that M should satisfy. Uh, so the uh, so uh, this particular M, which is the response to this field, should be such that the number of 
rate of in, uh, entry into K matches the rate of exit from K. So, uh, M sub i is a fraction of nodes in back of stage i? No, M sub i is the probability that this particular node which I have pulled out is in state i. Xi is the number of, uh, Xi i or Xi j is the number of nodes which are in back of state j. And so the back of states are encapsulated here in the field. Okay, yes. So you wrote uh, T psi is equal to M, but I was thinking of T psi in some sense was that attempt thing, right? Uh, not the that is in the level one. So okay. this is level two. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. So the T <laughs> will be the response function for the particular level. Okay, so so for here MI is basically if I take an individual node, it's distribution psi and then psi yeah. in some sense it's proxy for psi, right? right? Yeah. So this psi is the proxy for a generic node, and I'm assuming independence. I'm now pulling one node. And I'm asking what is this node's response to the field xi? That is m. So that means this node must essentially enter into state i with a certain rate, exit from state i with a certain rate. And that's captured by these mi's and m. So if, if, if I think that's a problem distribution, then it's just the one of the entries of that problem distribution, right? Xi, if you think of as a probability distribution, sorry, yes. Huh? So what then it's uh, so probability distribution of like P1, P2, P3. So it's basically one of them, right? The probability of being in one certain state. The Xi i is the probability that the generic node is in state i. I. Yeah. Correct. So, but why call it mi and not just call it? The... Because I pulled out one node and I'm seeing what that res that node's response is. So what is the response here? I'm not understanding. Okay. So uh, the response. So imagine a field. And then uh, this node is essentially interacting with this field. I want to write down a fixed point equation. I have to, uh, I mean, this was what I had indicated initially. So this node is responding to the field. When it responds to the field, it will have a certain response function to the field. So, for in, in our example of W, and what is this uh, T? In our, uh, this one was essentially 1 minus e to the minus. Uh, exactly, but that shows up in lambda i, you know? It's, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay, just hold on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think maybe the last uh, item here. Yes, the same thing. So xi is the prob empirical probability distribution. Yes. And you transform it through this t. Yes. M is the output. M is the response of a particular node in this field. <laughs> Which is also the, if you forget about this interpretation in terms of the mathematical dynamics, it's the output distribution. This is the fixed Correct. point. Yes, yeah. you can view it as the output distribution. Yes. Small thing, shouldn't it be lambda kj and not jk? Yeah, that might be the case. mk lambda kj. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what is the rate of transitions out of uh, state i? Well, mi is the probability that this node is in state i, and lambda ik are the transition rate. So the rate of exit from state i, uh, so the rate of entry into state k. So you uh, to come to k, you must be in some i and then enter k. So this is the entry into k, the rate of entry into k. That must, so that's when you sum it up across all the i not equal to k, that tells you the entry rate into k. That should match the exit rate. And the exit rate is, well, the probability of being in state k for this node, as far as this response function is concerned, is mk. And then this is the exit out of uh, exit rate out of k. And so you must have this particular equation hold. And that's the response uh, function for this particular uh, extracted node or the node that you have pulled out. Another, you can write this uh, in this matrix form. Uh, it's a matrix product form. Uh, you can see that it's mi lambda ik, and then if you just pull this to the left and with the negative sign, that's the uh, ii entry or the kk entry in this case of the diagonal uh, kk diagonal entry of the rate matrix. And so I can write this as actually m transpose lambda of xi equal to 0. So the response, m is the solution to this equation. Okay, so it's an implicit equation. What does self-consistency demand? And now I think this will clear your question. Self-consistency demands that your response match what you actually assumed and attributed to every other node as the field. And so xi transpose lambda of xi, this matrix product must actually be equal to 0. So is this clear? So that's the level one. <clears throat> so what's the connection between the two? So uh, take the xi that solves xi transpose lambda of xi equal to zero. So that's the level one uh, solution. Then compute the attempt for this. So that's the activity coefficient, c inner product of xi. Now you tag a node and compute collision probability for that. That's one minus 
e to the minus of the attempt. Now it's the same, we also saw that in the limit as n goes to infinity because of our scaling, it's the same regardless of the node's state. It's also the same for all the nodes. Verify that this particular thing that you started with actually implies that attempt is equal to the uh, attempt uh, equals g of collision for this particular collision or actually that it satisfies that fixed point equation and uh, the g of uh, the collision is given by this. Okay, so that's from the renewal reward theorem. Now of course uh, this is a tedious calculation uh, but it can be done and that's the connection between the two of them. So in some sense the level one uh, fixed point equation is actually telling a relationship between uh, macroscopic observables, attempt rates and collision probabilities, whereas the level two one is actually telling something about the distribution over states. Now uh, I'll now um, provide an analogy uh, to some statistical physics things that many of you may be familiar with. So uh, you might have heard of Charles law and Boyle's law uh, or the generalization which is PV is equal to nRT, that equation. So that's essentially a macroscopic uh, relationship between observable, uh, uh, that's a relationship between uh, macroscopic variables. So that's the uh, uh, level one fixed point. But the level two fixed point uh, is the uh, realization that the distribution of velocities uh, it follows, at equilibrium, follows the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Okay. So that's uh, the xi that we get here. Now, of course, the uh, what's the connection between the two? Can we actually get from this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution uh, the PV is equal to NRT law or Charles law and Boyle's law? Of course, yes, because you can essentially uh, under you can figure out that the pressure is actually how uh, a particle goes this way and then gets pushed back. These are elastic collisions, and then you look at what fraction of uh, if you take a small area, how many nodes will collide? and then uh, they get pushed back, so that gives you a certain amount of force per unit area, and that's the pressure. And then you use that uh, to essentially get uh, the uh, connection between the two of these things. And that connection is exactly uh, the one that's here as well. Okay, so that's uh, the connection between level one and level two. So, yes. So uh, this equation, uh, so except my equation from level one, need not imply that the underlying distribution is side, right? I mean, uh, can we go in the reverse direction? So from this, can we derive that? From this, can we derive that? So uh, your point is, perhaps there are multiple solutions to this, and uh, it might be the case that uh, not all of them will yield a particular xi which will have this. I haven't thought about it. Uh, that might be a way to resolve some of the multiple solutions to this. Is there solution. only one solution? Is there only one solution? It's always decreasing. Yeah. It's unique. This holding for all C may imply that it's it's a unique solution if the sequence C one over C zero is one over C zero is uh, increasing. Ah yes, one so over C zero. So it depends on the C i's. Yeah. Okay, so now I'll go to level three dynamics. Okay, so what's level three dynamics? So it's a dynamic. Uh, what's the level three fixed point? Level three fixed point involves dynamics. So. What's the dynamics? It's the dynamics of the empirical flow. So we'll build on the previous setting, uh, and the previous setting involved the xi, uh, which is some distribution of a particular particle, and then we ascribed or imputed this distribution to everybody in the system, and then looked at the field and thought of this as the field. Now we'll think of not xi, but a function of time, okay, xi dot. And then we'll look at the response, which is now an m dot. Okay, one particle will be extracted and we'll look at an m dot. Okay. okay, an individual's evolution of the probability distribution over states across time is now going to be called xi dot. And I will now uh, say that every node has this particular uh, uh, behavior. And then uh, I'll assume once again that the nodes evolve in an IID fashion. Now this will lead to a certain field, but this field you will recognize is something that changes with time because the xi changes with time. Okay. So the lambda ij of xi of t is the transition rate for a node in state i to a state j when uh, time is t. Okay. And now you can think of a particular node being pulled out and uh, identifying how it responds to this field. So how does it respond to this field? Well, uh, there's a certain probability that it has of being in state k 
and we can see how that probability changes with time. That probability, the rate at which the probability of being in state k changes, well, it depends on in rate and out rate. So this is the in rate into state k, and that's the out rate from state k. And you subtract this, and that's the net change of the probability of being in state k over time. Okay. So d m k of t by d t, I can now write it. <coughs> For, so that's level three, where we keep things uh, as functions of time. Okay, we don't ask for this to be zero. That's what we did when we went to level two. But in level three, we uh, make them uh, as functions of time. So another way of saying this is actually once again, if you recognize that uh, this is a matrix product, you can write this as m of t transpose the rate matrix. And the response now is a function of time, so it's an evolution. So that's m dot that response satisfies this differential equation. dm by dt is equal to m transpose lambda of xi. So xi is the field, lambda of xi is the uh, transition rates that a particular particle would see, and this particle's evolution is essentially characterized by this. So solve this, uh, it's, a, it's an ordinary differential equation, uh, because it, and it's a nonlinear, uh, no, in this case, it's a linear one, it's a linear equation, so you can solve this particular equation and you'll get an m of t. What's the fixed point now? The m dot must equal the xi dot. And so that's the self-consistency requirement. Self-consistency demands that m is equal to xi, so I can actually write this as d xi by dt equal to xi transpose lambda of xi. So in some sense, I'm demanding that uh, the response matches what the uh, assumption of the field is, and that leads to a nonlinear uh, ODE. So solve this particular one. Uh, solve this particular nonlinear ODE. Of course, it's if you fix this xi, it's a it's a linear ODE, but you have to essentially change this xi, look at the response, and look for a fixed point there. So it's a fixed point in the space of functions when you look at uh, this particular case, and that fixed point in the space of functions can actually be identified by solving this nonlinear ODE. So is this clear? And so what's now the connection between level three and level two? Well, level two is a steady state version of level three. Steady state because I set this dm by dt equal to zero, and I'll get level two. So let's look at this. So d xi by dt equal to zero implies that xi of t is a constant. But if xi of t is a constant, that d xi by dt was equal to xi transpose lambda of xi. And if that is equal to zero, then this is equal to zero. This was exactly the condition for level two. Xi of level two. OK, so that's level. Uh, uh, three. Now, level four. So what's level four? Uh, so level four involves a fixed point at the level of laws of Markovian evolution. So this is a, going to be a little difficult for me to explain, but I'll try my best. <coughs> okay. So level four involves the following. Suppose I have not M, uh, not mu dot, uh, sorry, not xi dot, uh, let's go back to level three. Level three involved evolution, which is xi dot, which is uh, xi of t is the, uh, is the uh, probability, uh, xi of t of i will be the probability of being in state i at time t. Okay, so that was a function of time. So it's a vector function of time. <coughs> now I'm going to think of a law for a particular node. Okay, so the law, is the, uh, describes completely the evolution of a particular particle. And now let me write down xi of t to be the marginal of that law. Marginal means that the law of x of t is equal to xi of t. Okay, so that's the marginal. So q in some sense like all finite dimensional distribution of the... Uh, <coughs> describes the evolution completely. For i, it, i is node. For the i node. Uh, for a particular node and I've indexed it as i and I'm going to ascribe this particular evolution to every node. That will be, that will then determine the field. So now there is no decoupling evolution. Now is the joint. That is going to be a decoupling evolution. Oh, soon, very soon. So, yeah. so when you say node i is evolving, it is evolving over what? Like what is the state space? Oh, uh, 0 to m minus 1. The same so as before. Z. It's a Markov process or it's a process evolving in state space Z. Z was the notation that I had. <clears throat> so this, uh, thanks to this xi, uh, once you uh, basically get this marginal, that defines, if you look at xi of t, that de defines the field at time t. And evolution of the field 
as time progresses, which I call as Zydot. Okay. Okay, we then have, if you look at the lambda of Zydot, that basically describes a time in homogeneous jump rate matrix. Okay, I'm being careful here, I'm not saying Markov yet, but it's just a bunch of rates. But these rates depend on time. Okay. Now, I took this Q, and then I attributed this Q to every node uh, as uh, the uh, law for each of the nodes. And then I found a field, okay, which is basically the marginal law at time t and how it evolves. And then I captured the rates. Now let's think of a particular, uh, uh, I'll extract one node from the system and I'll ask how does this node respond to that field when this is now viewed as the time varying transition rates. And I'll now describe a Markov process associated with that. So let that Markov process be P of Q. Of course I write it as P of Q because it depends on the Q. So the field will be determined by the Q that I started with. Okay, so P of Q is the response to this field. <laughs> So maybe I should have written a T of Q here. So, um, so this is the, uh, let uh, P of Q be the law of the new Markov. So now I'm thinking of this as a Markov process uh, with time in homogeneous jump rates, uh, which are given by lambda of Zy of T. T of Q is P, which is the new law for the... Ah, T of Q is equal to P, that's correct. <laughs> Self-consistency will demand that what I started with must match uh, the response. So Q is equal to T of Q. Okay. And so uh, when you uh, look at, so this is like the previous one as well. So there in the previous one, we essentially tried to solve uh, just an ODE. It was a linear ODE for each Xi. And then that was the response. And then we tried to match it. Here, uh, it is at the level of laws. So you start with a law. And then that law is projected to get a flow. That projection gives a bunch of rates. That rates defines a Markov process. And I demand that that Markov process be like the original Markov process. Okay. So this self-consistency uh, is like asking for a particular uh, solution for uh, equation to be solved. Uh, it's what is called a nonlinear Martingale problem. I'll come to that in the next slide. And we'll, we are looking for solutions for this nonlinear Martingale problem. So that means we want uh, laws which satisfy certain Martingale property, etc., which I'll come to in the next slide. So it must be some Markov process with, with some self-consistency requirement. Okay, so what is that? Some remarks on this Martingale problem. But by the way, this is level four. Level four is at the, at the level of laws of Markov processes. And I'll come back to relate it to level three. So some remarks on the Martingale problem. So, uh, so Martingale problems are the following. Suppose we are actually given only transition rates, lambda of t, time, in homogeneous uh, rates. And the question is, does a unique Markov process exist with these transition rates? And let's say I also specify the initial condition. Now, uh, in the case of uh, our finite state space system, when the rates are bounded, uh, this is not uh, that much of an issue. So uh, so here is the, so what, uh, why Martingale problem? So given these uh, transition rates and the initial law, find the process such that for any function f defined on the state space, this object that I have gotten based on what I have been given, which is the transition rates and so on, and some initial laws, that must be a martingale. So that's the requirement. And if you saw, if there is a process that satisfies this martingale property, then the process is a Markov process. Okay. And the question is, when I try to solve this in the space of laws, is there uniqueness the moment I give an initial condition? Uh, so if there is uniqueness, then we say that this Martingale problem is well posed and so on. Now, as far as our discrete state space problem is concerned, this is not an issue, particularly because the rates uh, we list, uh, we've assumed are all bounded. Uh, but it's an important issue when the state space is countably infinite. Okay, so for example, if the <coughs> Dachovs can go on forever, then a solution to this problem involves uh, some additional technicalities. Uh, whether a solution exists or not involves some additional technicalities. Alternatively, the, if the space is R, for example, then do we have some issues? Okay, but uh, we, um, if you find a solution to this, in particular, the forward Kolmogorov, it's a Markov process, so you can write down the forward Kolmogorov equation. So the forward Kolmogorov equation is exactly that, dzi by dt equal to Xi transpose lambda of this. That's how it evolves. And you will recognize that it's the continuous time analog of the more familiar pi n plus 1 is pi n times p. 
So uh, to relate it to this, you just have to subtract uh, pi n from this, and that's like the discrete time derivative. And that will give you p n, pi n multiplied by p n minus i. That's the analog of the rate matrix. Yeah, pi matrix. So this is for the uh, uh, regular Martingale problem. But of course, what we have is a nonlinear Martingale problem, where we actually start with some psi of t, and we uh, obtain the uh, Markov process, and then we project it, and we have to ensure that the projected psi of t matches with what we started. Okay, so if you have a solution to this, then you have a solution to this nonlinear Martingale problem. And so the question is: Is this nonlinear Martingale problem well posed? And so on? Is the solution? Does the solution exist? Is it unique? And so on? Okay, so now I'll, with this uh, um, general description of what a Martingale problem is and why this is called a nonlinear Martingale problem, I'll come to the connection between level four and level three. So level three speaks only about the evolution of the Zeit, but level four, level four speaks about loss. Level three asks you to solve this differential equation. It's a nonlinear differential equation. The process itself need not be Markov. And indeed, there are examples. Uh, so initially, I thought that uh, oh, if I uh, solve this, then uh, any process that has this particular margin uh, must be a Markov process. Uh, but then uh, there are examples where that's not the case. It can be hidden Markov, for example. Uh, so uh, level three asks only for the evolution of the loss. Whereas level four asks for the process to be Markovian, in the sense that conditional on the history, you can essentially forget everything else except the present. So the future is independent of the past given the present. So level 4 asks for a Markov process. So what's the connection between the two? The connection is the following. So get a level 4 solution. So that's a solution, that's a description of the law of this uh, evolution for a particular particle. Project it. That means you get its evolution. So uh, that's just the solution to the forward Kolmogorov equation. <coughs> View the lambda of the projection to be a time uh, inhomogeneous set of rates, okay? And then, so that's the time inhomogeneous transition rate matrix. Solve the forward Kolmogorov equation for this with the xi that comes from here. But since we have a solution to the nonlinear Martingale problem, that solution will essentially satisfy this equation. So it's actually a fixed point in the level three case. So that's uh, exactly the connection between the two. So level four asks for a fixed point at the, the level of processes. Level three asks only at the level of evolutions of flows, which are measured values. Okay, so here is a summary of the four levels once again. Level four solution is a solution to a nonlinear Martingale problem. X is then a special Markov process which has some properties. But level three, uh, the connection to that is uh, you just take this X of T and then. Uh, Look at its law and then look at it as a function of time. That solves a certain nonlinear ODE. Level 3 asks only for this. Level 2 lets time go to infinity and things have equilibrated. And so uh, if time has gone to infinity, this is 0. That means things have reached some steady state. And so xi transpose lambda of xi equals 0. So that's exactly. And level 1 is basically looking at only some macroscopic. Which is in this particular case collision probabilities. Okay, so what all do we need to make these ideas rigorous? Uh, as far as I'll just state the assumptions, I'm not going to speak about the tools. I'm not going to speak about the tools. Uh, so that uh, the assumptions are, as far as uh, level four and level three are concerned, we just need the nonlinear ODE to be well posed. Then the Martingale problem also happens to be well posed. And of course, the uh, because uh, uh, this one involves uh, flows over time, uh, the result is actually a finite horizon result. Okay. So that nonlinear ODE to be well posed is this that uh, must have a solution that's unique for any initial condition, and of course, additional conditions on regularities of the uh, of the ODE. So if you change the initial condition, then the path should not be uh, too far off. <coughs> as far as the uh, um, Level one and level two uh, uh, fixed points are considered for them to be valid. Uh, it is not enough for them to have a unique solution uh, like here. You need some additional conditions as well. And those additional conditions are that it has a globally asymptotically stable equilibrium. 
Okay, that's in the infinite uh, time horizon. So, uh, uh, this globally asymptotically stable solution is needed because you essentially let time also go to infinity and there is a certain interchange of limits. And to validate that, one needs uh, some additional stronger assumptions. Uh, this can be, uh, uh, this is weaker than this. All right, so uh, I'll now indicate miscellaneous insights and I'll stop. So the first thing is, I think uh, uh, I mentioned IID of IID nature of these uh, particles and their evolutions. So that's actually a decoupling assumption. So uh, you mentioned the word uh, decoupling. One can formally prove this. For example, let's tag L of the nodes and look at their evolution. So that's the Marco pro that's the law associated with the evolution of those L particles. Okay, not necessarily Markov. It depends on the number of nodes, etc. In fact, it's uh, it's hidden Markov. But then when you let n go to infinity, uh, these are actually independent and they are all, they are identically distributed as well. So the asymptotically is in the sense that the number of particles in the system goes to infinity. But I'm still looking at these n particles. And what's the marginal of each of these? That's just the Markov log cube. So that's basically saying that I'm looking at the evolution of these l particles those L particles are independent and identically distributed. The law of each one of them, because it's an evolution across time, is given by this Q, which is the solution to the problem. It's so level 5. Um, this is the real dynamics, right? Uh, this, uh, uh, so level 4 itself... Um, because it was individual particles. This is the one which captures joint behavior. Uh, yeah, that, that is correct. But I don't know if you can call it level 5 because I don't have a fixed point here. So. Okay, so then you can ask other questions. So for example, what's the chance that, so these are uh, evolutions, and I look at, let's say, uh, uh, n of, uh, there are n particles in the system, and then I look at the empirical measure. Okay. What's the chance that this empirical measure looks like a Markov law R instead of Q? So the limit law says that it must be like Q. When you have uh, IID particles, it should appear like, when you look at the empirical measure, it should look like Q. But what's the chance that it's not Q but R? Okay, so some of you who are familiar with uh, such, uh, uh, particularly Sanov's theorem, you would recognize that uh, it's of the form P to the minus N times some relative entropy. Here you can specify that relative entropy and it has good interpretation as well. So this is basically the statement that the uh, chance that it's like R is when well, here is the uh, um, R, that's the field, that R creates a particular P of R, that's that's how a particular node ought to look like, or the empirical measure ought to look like, but it's not looking like P of R, it's looking like R. And so what's the chance that this happens? Well, it, it's quite low, and it's e to the minus n times this relative entropy. And so what is the limit law? You can get the limit law by setting this to zero because the limit law says that you're there with high probability. <coughs> and when is it zero? It's zero when R is equal to P of R. So that's the fixed point in this level four. So one can get uh, this as well. So what's the chance that at stationarity, the N nodes distribution over states looks like some new, so some other measure. New. Well, it ought to look like that fixed point, right, at stationarity which solves xi transpose lambda of xi equals zero. But what's the chance that it's not there but at nu? So that's given by, once again, uh, e to the minus n times v of nu. Well, v of nu is some function. Just as one has a relative entropy interpretation here, there is also a relative entropy interpretation here. <coughs> uh, it's something that can be described, but I, uh, I'll skip it uh, for this talk. There is also a second law of thermodynamics. So for example, if you look at the evolution, that nonlinear ODE, <coughs> that nonlinear ODE and this particular V that you have here, that V satisfies this equation dV by dt is always less than or equal to zero. And that's like saying that the entropy always increases. So this V of xi of t is like an entropy function. Okay, all of these can be generalized uh, because we can remove this globally asymptotically stable equilibrium assumption. You can also uh, identify, if you look at these n particle systems and ask how long does it take for the system to mix uh, to close to the equilibrium distribution, that mixing time is actually quite small when you have a globally asymptotically stable equilibrium. 
but when you don't when there are uh, when the dynamics is such that there are other points where you can get trapped then it's of the order e to the n times some constant and that constant can also be characterized okay, so these are some interesting new results that, uh, this is probably the latest new result that so with that i will stop